Objection. This is a part of an injunction on the repetition of certain mantras leading to the attainment of divinity and is a mere eulogy. It has nothing to do with meditation. Reply. No, for there occur the words, He who knows thus. Objection. Since the text narrates an old story in this treatment of the Udgita, it must be a part of an injunction on the latter. Reply. No, for it is in different context. The Udgita has been enjoined elsewhere in the ceremonial portion, and this is a section on knowledge. Besides, the repetition of those mantras for the attainment of identity with the gods is not an independent act, for it is to be practiced only by one who meditates on the vital force, as described in this section. And this meditation on the vital force is represented as being independent, and a separate result is mentioned for it in the passage, This meditation on the vital force certainly wins the world. Mantra 1 3.28. Moreover, the vital force has been stated to be pure, and the organs impure. This implies that the vital force is enjoined as an object of meditation, for otherwise there would be no sense in calling it pure, and the organs, such as that of speech, mentioned along with it, impure, nor in extolling it, as is evident by the condemnation of the organ of speech, etc., the same remarks apply to the enunciation of the result of meditation on it. That fire, having transcended death, shines, etc. Mantra 1.3.12 Or the identification of the organ of speech, etc. with fire, and so on, is the result of attaining oneness with the vital force. Objection. Granted that the vital force is to be meditated upon, but it cannot possess the attributes of purity, etc. Reply. It must, or the Shruti says so. Objection. No, or the vital force being an object of meditation, the attributes referred to may just be a eulogy. Reply. Not so, for in scriptural, as in secular matters, correct understanding alone can lead to our well-being. In common life, one who understands things correctly attains what is good or avoids what is evil, not if one understands things wrongly. Similarly, here also, one can attain well-being if only one correctly understands the meaning of scriptural passages, and not otherwise. Besides, there is nothing to disprove the truth of objects corresponding to notions conveyed by the words of the scriptures, enjoining a meditation. Nor is there any exception in the Shrutis to meditation on the vital force as pure, etc. Since that meditation, we see, is conducive to our well-being, we accept it as true. And we see that the opposite course leads to evil. We notice in life that one who misjudges things takes a man, for instance, for a stump, or an enemy for a friend, comes to grief. Similarly, if the self... God, the deities, and so forth, of whom we hear from the scriptures, prove fictitious, then the scriptures, like secular things, would be a veritable source of evil. But this is acceptable to neither of us. Therefore, we conclude that the scriptures present, for the purposes of meditation, the self, God, the deities, and so on, as real. Objection. What do you say is wrong? or the name and other things are represented as Brahman. That is to say, the name and other things are obviously not Brahman, but the scriptures, we find, ask us, in direct opposition to fact, to look upon them as Brahman, which is analogous to regarding a stump, etc., as a man. 
Hence, it is not correct to say that one attains well-being by understanding things as they are from the scriptures. Reply, not so, for the difference is obvious, as in the case of an image. You are wrong to say that the scriptures ask us, in the face of fact, to look upon the name and other things which are not Brahman as Brahman, analogous to regarding a stump, etc., as a man. Objection. How? Reply. Because the scriptures enjoin meditation on the name, etc., as Brahman, for one who clearly knows that those things are different from Brahman. It is like meditation on the image, etc., as Vishnu. Just like the image, etc., the name and other things are used merely as aids to meditation. It is not meant that they are Brahman. So long as one does not know a stump as a stump, one mistakes it for a man. But meditation on the name, etc., as Brahman, is not of that erroneous nature. Namaste. So, this section, the Udgita Brahmana, is all about identifying speech as fire and identifying the self as the vital force, prana. So, does that mean that speech is fire? No. <laughs> does that mean the vital force is Brahman? Absolutely not. But these are apparencies, overlays, superimpositions on Brahman. Brahman has created these superimpositions himself. So they can be used as symbols for Brahman to denote Brahman in the mind and to be repeated as part of mantras, which will be given later on in this section. Why? Because the organs have a tendency to become fixated on the objects of the senses in the gross world, the environment of things. Huh? And we don't want things. We want the self. Self is never an object, so it never becomes a thing. It cannot be perceived. It cannot be understood by the mind either, because the mind works in symbols. And the best we can do with symbols is to superimpose them and make one thing stand for another. Uh, this is what we call meaning. So, you know, when I say cat, then you think of a cat, furry, four-footed animal, and so on. That does not mean the word is the thing. I can say cat, cat, cat all day long, and I don't have a cat. Huh? But we can assign a symbol to Brahma. And that is done in the very beginning of Kato Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, and so on, by accepting the word Aum as Brahma. Therefore, all Vedic mantras begin and end with Aum, because Aum is the beginning and the end of everything, the Alpha and the Omega. So, of course, the opponent is trying to undermine this understanding in different ways. First of all, they say, in general, that knowledge, because it's not an action, cannot be given in a Vedic injunction. And it's true. It can't be an injunction. It can be vidya or jnana but not an injunction. It's not, do this, don't do that. Instead, it's, think of this this way. And if you get the correct understanding, that is towards your well-being. It is a way to approach the final destination, which is Brahma, by way of various identifications with the power of speech, the vital force, etc. Now, speech is fire. Fire is pure because it burns all the impurities to ashes. 
all the things, all the forms, all the objects in the material world, at the end of the manifestation, are burned to ashes. Why? To purify them. Because they have evil. What is evil? The tendency, the selfish tendency to enjoy the qualities of the gross objects through the gross senses. Now, some people are doing Vedic sacrifices, chanting mantras and so on, with this end in mind, that I shall enjoy, I shall accrue wealth, I shall gain power and followers and so on. So this is evil. This is demoniac, actually. The demons like to pervert the Vedic principles and get the secondary results of wealth, intelligence, and so on for their own satisfaction. They don't engage in the Vedic principles either for their own well-being or for the well-being of others. But you see, this is the greatest gift. If you can accept this revealed knowledge of the Vedas, which comes from transcendental sources, greater than human intelligence, and deeper than individual insight, and you can operate according to these principles, you will find you get self-benefit without even trying. Why? It is a side effect. So if we pursue the main aim of the Vedas, which is self-realization, we automatically get the side effect of happiness, security, peace of mind, good character, knowledge, and even the mundane wealth, fame, and so on, huh? without striving for them, without having to create selfish thoughts that lead to rebirth. Thus, we can shed our karma like a snake sheds its skin and move on to the spiritual world, the Brahma Loka, at the end of this life without any karma to drag us down into another body. How is this possible? Well, the Upanishad is giving the means. First, it describes the horse sacrifice, by which one attains identity with Hiranyagarbha. Now, it's talking about identification with fire as speech. This is the secret of all mantras. This is how it works. The mantras burn to ashes all the evil, sinful, selfish desires that cause us so much trouble, uh, including rebirth in the material world and everything. So these things have to be purified by the performance of rites, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, mantras, pujas, homas, and so on. So when they are, then we develop love of God, bhakti. And that love of God, by contemplating the wonderful features and activities and nature of God, automatically leads to meditation, raja yoga. And then we give up all of these pale, temporary, material objects and we attain the self, that which is always existing, which is always knowledgeable, first of all, knowledgeable of itself, and then also of other things. In fact, it creates the other things <laughs> for its own enjoyment, ananda. This is Brahman, and we are that Brahman, and only through realizing that Brahman can be we can be released from the curse of individuality and selfishness and go back to our original nature as pure self. And of course, this is the highest bliss. This is what everybody actually wants. But because they are ruled by desire, because the organs have become impure, in other words, they have become demonic in the language of this brahmana, 
They have become like demons. They have to be reined in. They have to be controlled. In the beginning, by will. And after some period of time, it becomes a habit. For example, at this point in my life, I can't even imagine eating meat. I've been vegetarian since age 16. So it's like, you know, not even on the menu anymore. <laughs> the desire is gone. So what happens when we develop similar habits in the cause of other sense organs and activities? Then we can leave them aside. Why? The bliss that we get from self-realization is so much better than sense enjoyment. It's unchanging, inexhaustible, unconditional, <laughs> and so many other wonderful transcendental qualities that, I mean, who needs these sense objects? And even if we want sense objects, we can meditate on them and enjoy them just as much as uh, physical contact and still there's no diminution due to the influence of time. Uh, so this is the life. This is the state of the realized being. Externally, he performs different rites. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe he acts just as an ordinary person would. But... Well, we don't see what goes on internally. Internally, he is constantly in remembrance, constantly offering, worshiping the self within. So this is the enlightened life, and one has to attain it for one's greatest well-being, which is complete self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya <laughs>